Well, quite a busy day today. I have been uh, running around for the last 12 hours, a little tired. So if my ramblings today don't make sense, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I put a lot of effort into my messages, but um, unfortunately, uh, where, where the problem arises, I think, is somewhere around my mouth. And uh, the brain, and everywhere between that and my feet. I think that's where the problem is. <laughs> you guys, I'm, I'm joking. You guys look so serious, that, you know. <laughs> For a minute there, I think I got you guys. You were like, oh no, he really doesn't know what he's doing. It's okay, no, he does. Um, okay, so uh, before we get going here, um, on, on Wednesday nights, uh, Pastor does a, a deeper Bible study than we do on the, on the, on the weekends. I highly encourage you to, uh, to, to go to that. Um, I know he talked for, for a very lengthy time about, um, by lengthy time, I don't mean a single night, I mean over the course of weeks. He talked um, a lot about false prophets and stuff like that. It was very um, interesting stuff. And he's talked about, you know, the gifts of spirit. He, he talks about a lot of things that, um, you know, people have questions about. So uh, I would highly encourage you to come to that. It's on Wednesdays at 7. And uh, how about this? There's, there's youth on the same night. So you can get rid of your kids at the same time, too. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, and then um, Pastor's been on a series about our mouths. Um, for the past two weeks. Next week he'll be on part three. Um, a very interesting study. Um, this morning we looked at the definition of gossip and he had that part typically <laughs> on the definition. It typically involves that. <laughs> if you weren't here, it's not, I guess it's funny. Uh, <laughs> so we've been looking at, at this idea. Um, we've been looking at the idea of seek, give, pray, go, and we've, looked at, we've been looking at the Gospel of Matthew and Jesus and these four commandments that he gives um, throughout, uh, throughout Matthew. Um, and so last week we looked at giving, the week before that we looked at seeking, but right here in the middle of this we're just going to drop a little bit of a curveball and we're going to look at kind of the underlying foundation of everything about Jesus and everything about these four commands, and that is mission and purpose. Jesus knew why he was here, and everything that he did, he did for a reason. You know, you don't see Jesus acting aimlessly. It wasn't like he was wandering around. He knew what he was doing. He had a specific purpose for what he was doing. And uh, I think that if, it, if we were to look at these four commandments, seek, give, pray, go, without considering dream and vision and, and, and purpose in our lives, I think we would be doing Jesus a great injustice. So, um, you know, I, I, I have a dream, um, not just for Tularosa, not just for Tarrant County, not just for New Mexico, but I have a dream for the entire Southwest that it would be changed. When I say changed, I, I have a dream in my head of the Southwest no longer being known for drugs. I have that dream, and laugh all you want, but that's a dream. I don't look at what is and say this is what it has to be. I look at what isn't and I say, why can't it be? I see the Southwest and I see a place that God could do something. God can do something. I see the Southwest no longer known for drugs. I see it known for God. I see a day when the Southwest won't be known for pornography addiction and, and alcoholism, but it'll be known for a place where God is. That's my dream for the Southwest. It's, it's a big dream, because in the Southwest, if you're at all familiar with the Southwest, there's a lot of cult activity. There's, uh, I think Los Angeles is technically considered the Southwest. Uh, you know, we have Las Vegas. That's a big order to fill, but I think, God, I think God's big enough. I think God is big enough. I think God's big enough. We need to have dreams that scare us. You know, if, if you were to look at the, the dreams of Jesus' life, you'd probably laugh at his dreams too. He had a dream that one day, people would have free access to God by his single life and death and resurrection. 
That's silly. Nobody can do that. Yet he did it. He dreamt something that people didn't think were possible, and the Pharisees laughed at him for it. But he accomplished it, didn't he? Now the way to God is open for all who accept Jesus. And I believe something similar can happen nowadays. I believe that God can do something with the Southwest. I believe that no life is ever too far gone. In fact, we have on our bulletin, I don't know if you guys read this, Life's never hopeless, no person is beyond forgiveness, no fear is too great, no relationship is too broken, no addiction is too strong, no loneliness is too overwhelming, there is nothing too hard for God. Do we believe that, or do we just say it? So now we're going to look at this. This church has a dream, too. If you've been here for any amount of time, you know what that dream is. To build bridges in the community, and to restore people to God. That's the dream of this church. It is a dream that we hope to see accomplished in the Tularosa Basin. And that dream is how my dream will be fulfilled. You know what will change the Southwest? God. Restoring people to God and building bridges in the community, that will change it. And I, I fully believe that. Of course, like all dreams, there's the risk, and it could amount to nothing. But to do nothing... It's worse. So at the heart of these four commands, seek, give, pray, go, is purpose. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. You know, life, when you, when you talk about organizations, you talk about a life cycle. When, when, you, when you look at any organization, there's a life cycle. You know, you have someone who dreams about this organization. Then you have, you know, they do different things to get that organization started. They have, a, they have a good organization, and then inevitably it reaches the decline and death. And the organization dies and is dissolved, and another organization rises up to take its place. And you see the same thing happen in physical bodies. We are born as babies. We don't stay as babies. We grow up into teenagers, and then we grow up into adults, and then we grow into senior citizens, and then we die, and someone else takes our place in life. It's the great circle of life, as the Lion King calls it. And, uh, but I want to specifically talk about the life cycle of how a church works. Now, before you start thinking, wow, this is super boring, it has nothing to do with me, I promise you it does have something to do with you, just hang in there, okay? So this is a typical life cycle of a church. Now, I'm going to read the things out because you probably can't see them from back there, um, so the first one is dream. That's the vision. That's like somebody plants a church or something. That this is what they want to accomplish. Then there's beliefs. That's their guiding their guiding character. Like for instance, uh, we have the belief that Christians need to mature, that they need to serve other people, that they need to love people. These are all beliefs. They are guiding beliefs. So then from those beliefs, goals are established. We want to start a men's center in Tularosa. To get people off of drugs and get them back to be to be stable husbands for their wives and kids, to see them to see their lives change, to see them be productive members of society, that's still a dream. I haven't forgotten a dream. And then on top of those goals, we have structure. Now this people think oh structure is boring. Yes, it is boring, but without structure, nothing is able to be completed. So our structure looks something like this. We have pastor, associate pastors, we have a board, and then we have people that we're raising up to do things. We have what's called a process-oriented uh, ministry rather than a program-oriented. We don't try to just start ministries just to start ministries. We start ministries to guide people into a process of outside of the church to being a leader in the church. We have a process to what we're doing. On top of the structure, here's where ministry comes in. This is where people are actually doing things. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people like to slip into tradition around this area, and you start going down to the death. First, you hit nostalgia, then you hit questioning, and then you hit polarization, and then you hit death, or drop out, however you want to call it. So let's just look at this. Ministry is something that each of us do. When you make that effort to talk to your neighbor, when you make that effort to, to talk to somebody about Jesus, when you make that effort to connect with someone and to love someone and to serve someone, that's ministry. You know, a lot of what you see Jesus doing, Jesus wasn't 
clergy at a church. Did you know that? In fact, the clergy at his church made fun of him. So get this idea out of your head that ministry is something that a pastor does. That's just, that's just nonsense. That's, that's something that anyone who follows Jesus does. We love because he first loved us. That's life as a Christian. So ministry is built on a solid structure. It's based on a common goal and beliefs. It's founded on a dream. This of this rise here. So we have that idea as Christians that we do ministry rather than pastor does ministry. We do ministry. But see, what happens in a Christian life is because we don't really pay attention to things. So Satan picks us off one by one because whereas the church might be over here, we get ourselves over here by ourselves. See what I mean? If you can't see it, the church may be over here on structure and ministry, but we kind of go over here to maybe polarization or nostalgia. We don't get on board with what the church is doing. We just, or what God is doing or anything. We just kind of live our lives for ourselves. And as a result, Satan is able to pick us off because we have separated ourselves from the fold. Does that make sense? Think of it like this. If you are a wolf and you're trying to eat sheep, are you going to go with where all the sheep are together with the shepherd or are you going to go to the one sheep that's off by himself that the shepherd's not paying attention to? Or are you going to go to the one that nobody's paying attention to because I don't know if you know this about wolves, but they're actually kind of skittish. They, they don't really like you to mess with them. They, that's not their favorite thing. Uh, so... <laughs> And this has even happened here in the past where people just kind of, it, it reminds me of the book of Judges. In those days, Israel had no king, so everybody just did whatever the heck they wanted. You know, and that, that lawless stage. And, uh, <laughs> but sometimes as pastor leads us into ministry, we start getting real anxious. And we start having ideas that go something along the, along the lines of this. We've never done it like that before. Or, I don't think I'm qualified to do that. Or, what if it doesn't work? Or, I don't think the pastor can lead us there. And we start having these ideas and we start throwing them around. And because they're left unaddressed in our minds, that anxiety can, continues. Before I go further, I, I would just tell you, A, you're not qualified, but don't worry about it. God will qualify you as he uses you. Okay? Don't worry about it. Uh, B, nobody can lead us there. So don't, don't be too harsh on a pastor. But see, God will lead us there through the pastor. Ah, well, I can roll with that. Don't, don't, don't feel like, oh, well, I don't have much faith in him, so don't have faith in us. We're men. We make mistakes. Have faith in God, and God is leading us, right? Okay. So we can just circumnavigate that whole thing. <laughs> and as far as I've never, never done it like this before, if you continue doing things the way you've always done them, you'll get what you've always got. If you want to actually see Twitter Rosa change, you have to be willing to step out of your bubble. Amen. Oh, I want to see people get off drugs. How? How are you going to see that happen? Well, I don't know, but I want to see it happen. If you don't try to make it happen, it won't happen. That's the constant of life. I want to lose weight. What are you going to do? Nothing. I'm going to keep living how I want. I'm going to keep eating however I want, and I'm going to lose weight. How? How are you going to do that? So, I mean, we, oftentimes we do this at New Year's, don't we? We have our list of things we want to accomplish in the year, but we don't make it because we don't have a set list of how are we going to get there. We have our goals, and then we have this journey in between there and here, and we don't follow through because we don't make a plan. So we have a druggy situation. Okay, what are you going to do about it? So there's a difference between observing a problem and doing something about a problem. Those are two different things. Jesus saw a problem. We looked at this last week. Jesus saw a problem, and he answered. It wasn't enough that Jesus had compassion. He took the compassion and acted on it. See, this is our, this is our town, guys. You know, I was reading in Nehemiah. Nehemiah goes to this 
big long thing he says about how Israel has always failed God. He takes up the entire chapter, it's a prayer, and he goes from thing to thing to thing to thing that Israel has done wrong. And he's in his right. And then he says at the end of this, he says, we have done, we have acted evilly. He wasn't even alive when those things were going on. But he still said, we have acted evilly. See, the church, which includes us, has neglected a problem. And we've gotten wrapped up in our own country club. And, you know, you have to meet these requirements to be in our club. And anybody who wasn't in that didn't make it. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. See, even, even if you get on Facebook, for instance, you'll see a lot of Christians saying a lot of mean and hurtful things to other people. Usually revolve around politics. If politics are a good enough reason to hate someone, then you don't know what love is. That's just, that's just a fact of life. You need to be okay with the fact that some people are going to like President Trump and some people are not going to like President Trump. You have to be okay with that as a Christian. Your job is not to convert people into patriots. Your job is to love people. Look at who Jesus served. Look at who Jesus served. And how many times did he go off on some tangent about how they need to set Rome right with their Caesar and all this stuff? He, he didn't even, that was even his issue. He, he didn't even talk about it. He talked about this. In fact, the Pharisees tried to get him off course once by saying, do we pay taxes? And he said, hey, give, give to Caesar whatever Caesar. He completely circumnavigated the issue about uh, the Caesar. So just a few things here. Because we get anxiety as we're called into an area of ministry that we've never done, that anxiety becomes untreated. We, we, we don't answer that anxiety. What happens is that anxiety leads us to nostalgia. This is where we say things like this. I want to go back to how we used to do it. I don't like how things are going. It's uncomfortable. Or... I remember the good old days. And so what happens is we get out of sync with the rest of the church. We start heading over here because things aren't how we want them to be. And the pastor is trying to lead us all over here. We're out of sync with the mission. We have no purpose in our decisions. Oh, I'm going to stop doing ministry. Why? Because it fits better with the mission of the church or because you're only thinking about yourself? I'm going to stop going to church. Why? Because it fits better with the mission of the church? It doesn't, by the way. Or because you're going over here. You see the difference? Do what you do for a reason and for a purpose. For a reason and for a purpose. Everything Jesus did, he had a clear line of sight for what the end game was. There are some things that we do not do in this church just because it doesn't fit our ministry at all. It doesn't fit our mission. They may be good things, but they're not what we're doing. You see what I'm saying? So, this anxiety leads us to nostalgia, and we get out of sync with what the pastor's doing. Oftentimes when you come from another church, that, that happens, but that's for a different reason. That's because the old pastor was over here, and now you have to get back on board with this pastor, and you have to get rid of the idea that the old pastor was God. You just have to be willing to let him go and move on. That's just something that happens in life. Don't feel too bad. It happens to everybody. You, you meet somebody that you really like. They're a good leader. Or maybe they're a bad leader. You just like them. It doesn't really matter. In your head, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. And you latch on to them. But the problem is if you don't learn to grow with the new leader, you're going to find yourself over here. And it's going to affect your spiritual development. Okay? Physical things often have, uh, impact spiritual things. So because things are, un, are, are changing and there's, you can't go back and there's nothing you can do about the scary, scary situation you have anxiety about, you're in nostalgia, you start having depression. And depression takes you into questioning. Now at first this kind of seems, you know, innocent. Asking a hundred questions, always disagreeing with everything, refining everybody's ideas. Hey, you have an idea, that's fine, let me give you a better idea. Um, and if anybody says anything, you have to correct them for everything. Uh, it's not fun anymore. You're not having fun in ministry. You're not having fun in life. And you, you also have the, have the habit of sucking out fun in other people's lives too. Well, you're not living your life. And so you start, start because you're, you feel powerless in the situation. Because everything's changing around you. So you're in this area of questioning. You just start going crazy, nitpicking everybody. 
And then, if this is left untreated, now anger surfaces because you feel like, I can't do anything, I feel hopeless in this situation. And so your anger, remember, your anxiety led to depression, now the depression leads to anger. That anger, because it's impotent, it, 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 your anger doesn't have any feet to it. So it becomes misdirected. So you redirect it to other, other people. When, you're, when, you're, when, you're, uh, when you become a pastor and you go to a new church and they're over here, the organization is over here and you're trying to get them back over here where, where growth happens, where life as a Christian is supposed to happen, you usually find a lot of people uh, gossiping against you, backbiting you, fighting you on everything, even though you're doing the right thing as a leader and making the right shots as a leader. Why? Because they're over here still and you're trying to get them over here. They've had anxiety about the direction, which led to nostalgia, and they had depression about the situation, questioning everything. Now they're anger. Now they're anger. There, there's things that they just can't resolve, and the anger surfaces. I'm hopeless in the situation, and I will re And now their anger is redirected. Who do they redirect their anger to? The pastor, a lot of times. Uh, sometimes even people in the congregation, you see the congregation snapping at each other. Why? Because they have no mission, they have no goal, they have no purpose. Why should I forgive you unless it's part of my mission in life to forgive you? See the difference? When we start taking in offenses and we refuse to forgive people, we get off of these four commands, seek, give, pray, go, and we start focusing inward, we as a person, as a Christian, become unfocused. And then we're no longer seeking God's kingdom, we're seeking our own kingdom. See, this is very, very important to remember, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. Well, let's keep going. Oh, I, I, I have written here, often, often a spouse. <laughs> yes, your, your spiritual um, dwarfism rubs off on your marriage, too. Either you will change or go off the deep end. At this point, you will either change or you will go off the deep end. This is the crossroads. So how do you change? You go back to the dream. This is how you turn an organization around. But when you are the CEO of an organization and the organization is dying, how you get the organization to be effective again is you reinstitute a dream. It can be a new dream, it can be the old dream. It doesn't matter, you have to revalue the dream and it changes the organization. The same is true for a church. When a church is over here, the way you get them back over here is by relaying the dream. What's our dream? We want to see bridges built in the community. And we want to see people restored to God. That's our dream. We have a dream. Now we can get here. But if we start to forget that dream, we're going to start to get over here. We're going to start nitpicking the pastor for everything that he does because we don't like it. Not because it's not meeting this or this, but because we don't like it, because we're over here. Now hold on, don't 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 lose me yet. You 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 you've gone this far with this, and at this point is what I want to say something that I mentioned last week. Faithfulness says I won't talk about you, Pastor. I won't talk about you, leaders. I won't talk about you, other Christians. We are a body. We are a family. We don't talk about each other. I don't gossip about about you. You don't gossip about me, right? But loyalty is different. Loyalty says you won't talk about the pastor. That's where I come in and, and somebody's talking about the pastor and I say, uh, no, nope. We don't talk about the pastor. Why, because he's God? No, because that's not how we do things here. I walk in and I, and I hear somebody talking about my worship team. No, 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 no. We don't do that here. That's not, that's not the way this church operates. We don't gossip, we don't backbite. It, backbite, it doesn't fit our mission. It does not fit our mission. Is it restoring people to God? No. Is it building bridges in the community? Definitely no. So do we do it? No. See, a clear definition of what we are doing, living life with purpose. I wish I would have known these things when I was a kid. Because I spent so much of my youth with no purpose and no direction. If you grumble in your heart, you will say and do what you thought you never would. I'll say that again. If you grumble in your heart, you will say and do things that you never thought you would. Stop complaining all the time. So, okay, 
We've gotten anger, and, and so, okay, what happens then? Well, I don't like how you're doing it. We start criticizing everything for everybody. John, you're doing a bad job. I don't like how you're doing it. Pastor, you're doing a bad job. I don't like how you're doing it. We start nitpicking everything. And oftentimes, I will say this, oftentimes people who are on this stage spend just as much time criticizing themselves as they do others. Because if you're not at peace here, you won't be at peace here. Does that make sense? Pastor talked about this this morning a little bit. He didn't know, he, he didn't know what I was talking about. In fact, I've been very tight-lipped about this one. So either you will change or you will go off the deep end. So this anger leads to what's called polarization. That's the next step right before death. Now, polarization is basically us versus them. It consists of Christians in the church having prolonged fights, unresolved conflict. It starts out small. It starts out small. Okay, so maybe John does something I'm like, ah, I don't like that. But then I start stewing about it. I really don't like that. Then I start talking to other people about it. Chuck, I don't like that you did that. And never once do I address him. And the conflict keeps going on and on. See what I mean? And now there's a big blown out con conflict and it's now us versus them. I've got my homies with me. He's got his homies with him because he needed to array himself because I was opposing him, right? So now we've got this, the, this standoff in the church. How is that showing God's love? See, it became polarized. There's no, there's no longer a purpose for the organization to exist. Did you hear what I just said? At this point, there's no longer a purpose for the organization to exist. It's doing more harm than good. For those of you who've been in this church for a long time, you know that 10 years ago it was like that. We've come a long way, and we're not done yet. We haven't arrived yet. Don't, don't start getting comfortable yet. We're, we're moving forward. We're building something. We're building a better tomorrow. Why? Because we want to see something happen about the druggies. We don't want to round them up and kill them. We want to see their lives changed. We want to see something about all the kids that are stuck in, stuck in CYFD. We want to see something about this. It's not good enough for us to complain and just sit there and analyze the problem. We want to do something about it. And this is how we do it. This is how we do it. So the anger led to polarization. And as lines are drawn, now this is where we get to something really dangerous and your salvation is at stake. Pride arises. I'm right, you're wrong. And now we're at a point in our lives where we can no longer say, look, I'm sorry. And in fact, we've worked ourselves into a problem because now I have too much pride to go to you and say that I was wrong. See, now we're in a really big problem. We've gotten ourselves into a rut. We don't know how to get out because we can't say sorry because our pride is there. See, our pride got us into it and it's keeping us from getting out of it. And now we're in a bit of a problem. And we get in this circle of death. And if that circle, if that pattern is left unchanged of gossiping and complaining and backbiting, your spiritual life dies. How you treat other people is absolutely essential to your relationship with God. John said it like this. If you say that you love God, but you don't love people, you're lying. So, you know, we go through similar life cycles in our lives, but we also do spiritually. We also go, go, through, uh, go through life cycles spiritually. Where in our life, we are no longer dreaming dreams anymore. In our spirit, we're no longer asking God for the big things. We're no longer having a dream or a purpose in our lives. We're no longer praying with meaning and purpose. Now we're just going through the dead end process of, pray, of praying simplistic prayers that mean nothing, of gossiping about people and fighting everybody. And we, in our spirit, not as an organization, the same principle is true as a person. We, in our spirit, are over here. And we start seeing ourselves as the victim and everybody else as the transgressor. They're doing me wrong. And in our spirit, we start questioning everything. We start going back in nostalgia. Man, I remember the good old days. I remember when I was a kid. I remember when God was using me in big ways. I remember when I had a dream. I remember when I had a dream. And we find ourselves over here, and our spirit is dying. And the only thing that will save us is renewing that dream. I have a dream for the Southwest. Do you have a dream for the Southwest? 
I have a dream that only God can fulfill. Do you have a dream that only God can fulfill? Are you seeking with something small? Something like, maybe God will make me feel better about my kids. Forget that. I want to see God do something in my family. I want to see him do something in, in the community. I want to see him do something in the drug community. I want to see drug sellers out of business because nobody's buying anymore. I would love to see that. That would be the bomb. That would be the bomb. So as pride settles in our life and we're past the polarization stage, now we get to apathy. Do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. I'm going to do what I want. Pastor, you go ahead and leave the church wherever you want. I I'm good here. I'm just going to do this. You do whatever you want. Apathy. The pride gives way to apathy. So this is the cycle once again. Something happens. We get into anxiety. That gives us nostalgia. Man, I, I want to go back to how it was. Then we get to dep depression because we can't go back. It doesn't matter what the situation is. You can never go back. When you're 30, you can't be 20. When you're 50, you can't be 30. You can never go back. Then after depression, you start getting into questioning. But then because you, you have all these unresolved issues, you get into anger. That gives rise to polarization, me versus you. And then that, that pride gives way to apathy. I just don't care. You do whatever you want. I'm out. I'm out. I'm not trying anymore. I'm right and you're wrong, and that's just how it is. I can't deal with this anymore, Pastor, so you do whatever you want. I'm gone. I'll give you a little secret. When you win, we win. And when we win, you win. Remember that. You might not see how it applies now, but you will. You will. It's not that you're opposed to the vision that the pastor is leading us to. You're not opposed to the dream that the pastor has set before us. Restore people to God. That sounds like a good idea. Okay. And, you know, building bridges in the community. Hey, that sounds like a good idea, too. It's not necessarily that you're opposed to that vision. You just aren't on board with it. Think of it as being on a boat. It's not that you're rowing against the pastor. You're just not rowing with him either. Now, we do this for a lot of different reasons. Maybe, maybe you just don't like the pastor. Maybe, maybe you don't like how someone's doing their job. Maybe you don't like how someone's doing their ministry. You know, I saw John doing some stuff in food pantry, and I just don't think that he's doing a good job. Now, while I'm doing nothing in the food pantry, right? Even if I was doing something in the food pantry, does that give me a right to nitpick my leader? You see where I'm going with this? We are all in an organization. And just because someone is doing something we don't like doesn't give us the right to nitpick the pastor, the leadership, whoever's leading that ministry. You see, we have to be in the same boat, rowing together if we want to get there. So often we blame others for where we ourselves are when it's our own fault. We got ourselves over here. We, were, we failed to ignite the vision, to ignite the dream for our future in our own lives. And then we got angry, so we started putting the blame on somebody else. Typically, we pick whoever is the most obvious target. Pastors tend to be the most obvious target because they're the ones over the church. Why would I pick a peon when I can go straight for the gold? You know what I mean? Just how people think. So then that takes us to kind of the, the, the grand finale here, okay? Where, where do we go from here? So we've talked about all this stuff, uh, about organizations dying, and okay, that's fine, you know, whatever. Uh, what's the takeaway from this? The takeaway from this is twofold. First off, there's some things that you can do, but before we get to those, remember this. Your spiritual life is on a life cycle too. Get away from gossiping and complaining, renew that dream, because God has a plan for the Southwest. You can either be on board, or you can see it pass you by. Do whatever you want. But whatever choices you make today will stick with you tomorrow. Never forget that. Every day you waste is another day that God's vision is being carried out in somebody else's life. Don't you want to be a part of the winning team? 
Then the second thing, just a few lists of things that you can do to help renew your spirit. First off, resolve conflicts quickly. Quickly. Don't wait and carry the weight of a conflict. Don't do it. In your life, have a, have a spirit of I'm okay with being wrong. Be okay with being wrong. You know, as leaders, we make choices. We are willing to take risks. And we realize that when we take risks, we're going to have some failures. That's okay. That's what you have to do as a leader. You have to be willing to make mistakes. You have to be willing to make a failure. If you're not willing to make a mistake, don't ever have kids. Because you will never, ever, ever be a perfect parent. You will always make a mistake. So with that, with that being said, resolve your conflicts quickly. Just kill your pride. I mean, honestly, just kill it. Kill it. The quicker, the better. It's like tearing off a band-aid. You can sit there and worry about tearing off the band-aid, and it'll just, you'll psych yourself out, or you can just rip it off and be done with it. Or like when you're standing on a pool, and you're like, oh, it's going to be so cold when I jump in. Oh, just jump in. Just jump in. Or you can do the thing where you stick your toe in, and you're like, oh, it's so cold. Oh, it's so cold. And you stick the, a little bit of your foot, and you're like, oh, it's still so cold. And then, you know, 15 minutes later, you're still crawling into the pool. Just jump into the pool. It's like that with pride. Don't, don't, don't let pride get the better of you. Just, just jump in. Resolve conflicts quickly. Get back on track. What are you here for? What's your life purpose? If you can't answer in the span of three seconds, you're off course. If I, if I ask you right now, what's your purpose in life? One, two, three. If you don't know what it was in your head just now, you're off course. Stop. You need to have a clear purpose in your life. Have a purpose in your life. Because all of these four commandments that we've been looking at, see, give, and next week we do pray, it's not going to mean anything if you don't have a purpose in your life. Stop gossiping and complaining. For the love of God, stop gossiping and complaining. Your life, you have to live it. You can live it with joy or you can live it with sorrow. You can go through it with courage or you can go through it with weakness. But whatever you do, you can't do the other one. You can sit around gossiping and complaining about all your problems or you can face them like a man or like a woman. They're your problems anyways. If you would rather sit around and complain about your problems, fine, but you're not going to see a positive outcome. Get in prayer in the Bible. You need this. And I will say this, going back to the stop gossiping and complaining, stop gossiping and complaining in your head, too. So what we say is, oh, well, I'm real proud of myself because I stopped talking to other people. But you still have these ideas popping around your head all the time, nitpicking everybody and how they're doing a bad job and everything. So the problem's still there. So get back in prayer. Get back. I'm going to leave that up just so if you want to look at that again. You can work yourself out of spiritual death. You can. It's going to require a lot of work. It's going to require a lot of work, but you can do it. I, I was actually talking to somebody um, this past week, and they were talking about depression. And they were talking about the way that with depression, you know, you go through these cycles and everything. And I said, yeah, but you can do something about it. And I said, no, I'm going to live with this for the rest of my life. And I said, yeah, you probably will live with your for the rest of your life, but you can do something about it. You can be proactive. You can learn tools and techniques to face it. You can read your Bible and pray. That'll do, I mean, leaps and bounds. I will say this. In all my struggle with anxiety and depression, the Bible and prayer has done more than a pill ever has. Don't take my word for it. Try it yourself. See, the thing about the Bible is it's living. It is a living book. You don't have to take my word for it. Try it yourself. It'll change things. But I, I want to get back to the, to the main topic here. If you find yourself, if you'll join me in prayer, if you find yourself living life just day by day with no purpose, no direction, I just want you to take a few minutes to say, God, God, give me the dream. God, give me the dream. Maybe you had a dream once and you've just forgotten. Don't go there. Wake it back up. Fan it back to flame. Pretend like it's a fire in your heart. And it's just nothing more than, than, than burnt out coals and ash. Fan it back into a flame. Work diligently. You can do it. God, I pray for those people who had a dream and they lost it. 
God put a fire in their soul. Put a fire in their soul. Lord, I pray for those people who don't have a purpose. Maybe they're looking for some, some big sign from you to show them their, their one purpose in life when all you're trying to do is put a fire in their heart. God, I pray for those people that they would stop for long enough to listen to you speak. And Lord, I pray for those of us who have a dream that we wouldn't forget to stay on target and that we would never, ever, ever think that we're better than someone else just because we know where we're going. God, I believe that you can do something past what we think you can. I believe you can do something past what is possible. Just take a few minutes just to pray in your heart and your spirit.